that's when I wrote Resonate. That felt like a dissertation in rhetoric, writing this book. It was fun, it was hard, it was like a puzzle. It just kept me up at night until I could actually see the structure. And I'll walk you through just one example um, from the book. If you see my TED Talk, this is a, um, an example. But it's also, the whole thing is going to be an example of the impact that thought leadership has had on my business. So if you're not a thought leader and you're not a, a, a creator of content, a creator of new insights, um, I strongly um, urge you to go and become that um, because it's dramatically impacted my business. So then in 2011, I did a TEDx talk. Um, and then when it hit about 50,000 views, I was so pleased, I tweeted it. It had been like six months. It hit 50,000 views on YouTube. And I tweeted it and I copied TED, who is a client, but still I didn't think they looked at my Twitter feed. And then they picked it up, put it on TED.com. It had like a million two views. And then uh, TED did something to their thing. It dropped to half a million views, which was so sad for me. So I think we're creeping up. I don't know. I may have hit a million views over the last couple of weeks. So that completely rocked my business, and I'll show you the impact. But I'll show you an excerpt from the talk that's an excerpt from the book, and it's how uh, Steve Jobs used story patterns in his talk. So the big thing that I found in Resonate that's the power of a story is that you build tension and it releases. You get this cathartic release when you're, when you're telling a story. So I thought, gosh, these speeches have this rhythm, a pulse, a cadence to them that I thought they're building tension and releasing it, but I wanted to figure out why or how they're doing that. And so I made a discovery that basically the structure of the greatest speeches moves between what is, what could be. And then structurally it moves back to what is, what could be. What's happening is they're saying, hey, here's the current state, here's what's going on, here's the state of the union, here's the elephant in the room, but look, here's what could be. So it's like anticipating a better future. It's saying, but look, if we all move this direction, this could be our reality in the future. So that's what happens. It moves back and forth between what is, what could be, and then the ending ends with the new list. So I'm going to walk through how um, Steve Jobs' talk, his 2007 iPhone launch speech, actually follows that pattern. So he gave a 90-minute talk, which don't ever do that, unless you're Steve Jobs. Um, but I'll show you the reason why. He could keep an audience enthralled for 90 minutes. Um, I'm going to zoom in. Um, so obviously, he would speak. He would cut to video, so that's another form of contrast. He would not just be him doing one directional diatribes. He mixed up the media. And then he also would cut to demos. And his demos always involved humans. It would be like, oh, look, I have a visual voice in mail from Al Gore. And he would go, or let's call it Starbucks and order 4,000 lattes for you. Well, how come some of the Starbucks answered the phone? And, you know, that was all planned. So if you have software or you do demos, how fun it would be to use a literary figure in your demos that makes people go, my God, that was so clever. And I just, you know, I just love that literary figure from Les Mis, or <laughs> that'd be a terrible one to use. But um, <laughs> you, you can do things that pull the human nature and storytelling um, into everything you do. And then um, he brought up guest speakers in blue, which I'll scoot across and show you in a second. But this, for me, was the most profound insight. This is why Mr. Jobs could keep them enthralled for night. Every one of these vertical tick marks is where the audience laughed. And every one of these vertical tick marks is where they clapped. Now the phenomenal thing about storytelling is that we do physically react. You laugh, you clap, you cry, you lean forward, you jump back, you get a chill down your spine. People don't even realize that your eyes dilate when you're hearing something that delights you. So the fact that they laughed and clapped, that's a lot of physical reaction while he's speaking. And that's actually unparalleled at this point in time. I haven't been able to find anybody that does it like that. So he enters into what could be by saying, this is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. So he's known about the phone for a long time, yet he's acting like he's seeing it for the first time. <coughs> like it's this maddening love affair he has with this device. Because this next tick mark is interesting. This is where Mr. Jobs marveled at his own product. So he would already seen it forever, and he's like, isn't it great? It's so beautiful. Like he's just doing these exclamatory, boisterous little bursts of affection for his own product. I think that's half the battle, is being in love with what we do, being in love with what we sell, and just really loving it. Just really loving it and letting it show. So he kicks off um, the announcement saying, every once in a while a revolutionary product comes along and changes everything. Now, you may not realize how much the phone changed everything, because there's a lot of young people there. But he uh, introduced the phone, and you can see that the line stays white till right about there. 
Now it's white because he's showing photos of the phone. He's just saying, oh, and there's this little hole here in this button, and there's a switch, and then they're just slides where he's showing the hardware. Right here, he goes into a demo, and he created what we call a star moment. And star is an acronym for something they'll always remember. This was where Mr. Jobs turned the phone on. The audience saw scrolling for the first time, and you could hear them gasp. <gasps> hear the gasp in the audience because they knew he had made a revolutionary product that would change everything. So then you scoot across, you'll see um, the two batches of blue at the top. One is the Yahoo CEO, one is the Google CEO. Um, this long batch of blue right here is the AT&T CEO. Now he took way too long. <laughs> he read off the four by six cards. There's no laughing, no flapping, no marbling for the whole time. <laughs> and then I put a little break in the line because there was a technical malfunction they turned the uh, clicker over to um, Mr. Jobs, they handed it back. So what do you think one of the greatest business communicators does is he tells a personal story where he and Steve Wozniak created technical malfunctions on the Berkeley campus when they did television jamming. And then it returns to him, he states the new bliss, and he uses a quote. He says, there's an old Wayne Gretzky quote that I love. I skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where it's been. We've always tried to do that at Apple since the very, very beginning, and we always will. That was his new bliss. He's promising them we will continue to create revolutionary products in the future. And then they had a John Mayer concert. Back then, that was really cool. And, 